Welcome to our 11th session of the New Testament. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A few things to keep in mind for Matthew is that Matthew was writing for a community, Christian community, that is converts from Judaism. So what he's trying to tell them is the fact that it's like moving into a new home. You want to hang on to your old ways, but somehow or other, the new ways have to be put into it. In other words, they're so accustomed to their Jewish customs, and they're trying to fit in some of the ideals of being followers of Christ. At the end of our last session, I took a quote from Jesus. He said, every scribe who has been instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who brings from his storeroom both the new and the old. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill the law. About the year 54, they were telling the people, you don't have to follow the dietary laws anymore. Anybody who's a convert from the Gentiles is not going to be forced into following the Jewish dietary laws. So they're putting the new into the old, moving into their new house. And so Matthew, in a sense, is trying to identify that idea, or that way of thinking, and put it into their mind. So now Jesus, in this chapter, he goes to his native place, his hometown of Nazareth. So Jesus came to his native place and taught the people in their synagogue. Matthew is writing about the year 85. Fifteen years before he wrote this, there was an invasion by Rome into Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple. And when the temple was destroyed, the synagogue became a very powerful form of gathering for the Jewish people. When the temple was destroyed, the Sadducees disappeared because their ministry centered on the temple. And now the Pharisees, whose ministry centers more on the synagogue, they came and came into power. And as a result of coming into power, they saw the followers of Christ as contaminating the Jewish faith. And so they began to cast the converts to Christ out of their synagogues, which is why we now read here in Matthew's gospel, he came to his native place and taught the people in their synagogue. He no longer says our synagogue. So they were astonished. So he's talking about Jesus during his lifetime. And they said, where did this man get such wisdom and mighty deeds? Is he not the carpenter's son? In Mark's gospel, he writes that, is he not the carpenter? But Matthew tries to make Jesus a little more dignified. He can't call him a common carpenter. At least that's Matthew's way of thinking. So he says, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother man named Mary? And his brothers, Joses, Joseph, Simon, and Judas. Again, if they belonged to the tribe, they were considered brothers and sisters. Are not his sisters all with us? Again, anybody who belonged to the tribe, not just to the immediate family. Where did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his native place and in his own house. Someone can honor a prophet, but when they go back to the place where they grew up, people say, oh, we knew him when he was younger. He's not that great. It even happens today. And so what happens is because we know someone from the time of their youth, we forget. They have matured. They have grown. So he says, a prophet is not without honor, except in his native place and in his own home. 
And he did not work many mighty deeds there because of their lack of faith. Matthew is taking these sections from Mark. He's copying them, but he's changing them a little bit. And he says, Jesus didn't perform mighty deeds there because of their lack of faith. In Mark's gospel, he says he could not perform any deeds. But in Matthew's gospel, he wants to give the idea that Jesus is really in control. Mark is not afraid to say Jesus became thoroughly human as we are. Chapter 14. Herod's opinion of Jesus. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the reputation of Jesus. And he said to his servants, this man is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why many powers are at work in him. Now Herod had arrested John, bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. For John had said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Although he wanted to kill John, he feared the people, for they regarded him as a prophet. But at a birthday celebration for Herod, the daughter of Herodias performed a dance before the guests and delighted Herod, so much that he swore to give her whatever she might ask for. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was distressed, but because of his oaths and the guests who were present, he ordered that it be given. And he had John beheaded in the prison. John's head was brought in on a platter and given to the girl who took it to her mother. John's disciples came and took away the corpse and buried him. And they went and told Jesus. It's kind of an image of Jesus' burial. Jesus' disciples bury him and they go and tell Herod. But here they go and tell Jesus and Jesus now commits himself to his ministry. When Jesus heard of it, he withdrew in a boat to a deserted place by himself. It gets the image of grieving over the loss of John, the death of John. The crowds heard of this and followed him on foot from their towns. When he disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them, and he cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples approached him and said, This is a deserted place and it is already late. Dismiss the crowd so that they can go to the villages and buy some food for themselves. Jesus said to them, There is no need for them to go away. Give them some food yourselves. But they said to him, Five loaves and two fish are all we have here. And he said, bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowd to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven, he said the blessing, broke the loaves, and gave, it, they gave them to the disciples, who in turn gave them to the crowds. They all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up the fragments left over, twelve wicker baskets full. Those who ate were about five thousand men, not counting women and children. As you remember, that same section was in the Gospel of Mark. Then he made his disciples get into the boat and precede him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. After doing so, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Very often, when the scriptures tell us that Jesus is going to pray, 
It's also preparing us for something that is about to happen, some kind of miraculous thought or some kind of missionary discipleship call. A call. When it was evening, he was there alone. Meanwhile, the boat, already a few miles offshore, was being tossed about by the waves, for the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, probably between three and six o'clock in the morning, he came toward them, walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. At once, Jesus spoke to them, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him in reply, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw how strong the wind was, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? After they got into the boat, the wind died down. Those who were in the boat did him homage, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When this story is in Matthew, we see where Peter gets out of the boat, starts to walk on the water. And the idea behind that, we apply it to other parts of the scriptures. But when Jesus goes through his passion, Peter says, Lord, if you die, I'll go to die with you. And right away, he has his eyes on, on Jesus. He's brave. But then he looks around at the storm. He comes into the garden and they say, surely you're one of his followers. He begins to sink. He said, no, I'm not one of them. And the idea is he's out in the storm. He's out in the world. He's looking at Jesus. He's strong. But then Jesus comes by. Peter sees Jesus and begins to weep. He realizes what he did. And Peter then, apparently, becomes a great and brave apostle. And so we see how the parallel between some of one story and some stories in the scriptures and other stories. And then in this, when the disciples see this at the end of the story, in many writings of Mark, they are astounded. But here he tells us that the apostles say, truly, you are the son of God. A different response. After making the crossing, they came to land at Genezareth. When the men of that place recognized him, they sent word to all surrounding countryside. People brought to him all those who were sick and begged him that they might touch only the tassel of his cloak. And as many as touched it were healed. Chapter 15, the tradition of the elders. Then the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They do not wash their hands when they eat a meal. He said to them in reply, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever curses, father or mother, shall die. But you say, whoever says to father or mother, any support you might have had from me is dedicated to God, and therefore need not, the person need not honor his father or mother. You have nullified the word of God for the sake of your tradition. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you when he said, 
These people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines human precepts. Jesus is confronted by the Pharisees who come and they're complaining that your disciples don't wash their hands before eating. It was never a law of Moses for the ordinary person. The Sadducees would have to wash their hands because they worked in the temple. They were dealing with sacred objects, sacred things that they had to offer to God. So they had to wash their hands before eating or doing anything else. And so a tradition built up. They moved it from there over into the daily life of the people. Not from Moses, but really from the fact the Sadducees used to do this. So it really wasn't a command from God. And then what happens? He says, you keep alive your traditions. For instance, you're told to honor your father and your mother. And yet you say that if they say, well, everything I have is now dedicated to God, then you don't have to give anything to your father or mother. And Jesus does not condone this condition. They have made up a law that supersedes God's law, which is a tradition. They invent it. And so Jesus is saying, you protect your own traditions. However, realize we still have God's law. And so these people, they honor me with their lips. They do these pious things, but their heart is far from me. Their heart is in keeping the traditions. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines, mere human precepts. Perhaps we all have to worry about that. The idea of teaching as doctrine, something that's not scriptural, and yet something that sometimes seems to be part of a law which we learn it's not. He summoned the crowd and said to them, Hear and understand. It is not what enters one, one's mouth that defiles that person, but what comes out of the mouth is what defiles that person. Then his disciples approached him and said, Do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He said in reply, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. If a blind person leads a blind person, both fall into a pit. Then Peter said to him in reply, Explain this parable to us. He said to them, Are even you still without understanding? Do you not realize that everything that enters is expelled into the latrine? But things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile. For from the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, unchastity, theft, false witness, blasphemy. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. When Christians began to believe in Christ, they were suddenly relieved in a sense, especially the Gentiles, from certain laws, certain Jewish laws and customs. And so what Jesus is saying, they can eat other kinds of food. What a person eats does not defile the person. He says it passes off, that, that when we eat food, that we pass it off through the intestines, the ordinary way. But then he says, what comes forth from the mouth of a person? That's from the heart of the person. What we say, what we express, what language we use. That defiles the person if it's used blasphemies. And so what happens? Evil thoughts, they come from the heart. Murder, it comes from the heart. Adultery, it comes from the heart. It's what a person intends. Unchastity, theft, false witness, blasphemy. All these come from the heart, from the person. So he's really saying it's what the person does is what matters. Not simply these things. They are what defile a person. But to eat without unwashed hands, that doesn't defile a person. Then Jesus went from that place 
and withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman of that district came and called out, Have pity on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. Once she calls him the son of David, she's showing belief that he really is the Messiah. They were expecting the Messiah to come from the family of David. And so she said, son of David, that's her belief expressed. But Jesus did not say a word to the, an answer to the woman. His disciples came and asked him, send her away, for she keeps calling out after us. He said in reply, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the woman came and did him homage, saying, Lord, help me. He said in reply, it is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. She said, please, Lord, for even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table of their masters. Then Jesus said to her in reply, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that hour. Matthew had to explain to the people that Jesus didn't reject them. They rejected Jesus. The Jewish leadership rejected Jesus. Jesus didn't reject them. Jesus tried to share his message with them. And so what happens is he's saying here, I've come for Israel. I've come for the people of Israel. And the woman is not a Jew. So he said, I really didn't come for all of you, perhaps thinking that's going to be done later. But the woman expresses faith. And in expressing faith, he realizes that the Gentiles, others outside Judaism, have already seen him, who he has seen him as he truly is. And so he said he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel, but the woman, because of her faith, is able to have Jesus respond to her need. Again, what Matthew is teaching is that because of the faith of others, they've received the gift of being able to reach out to Christ and become Christian. But then what happened? Some rejected Christ. Christ came for the Jewish leaders, but they rejected him. Moving on from there, Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, went up on the mountain, and sat down there. Again, sitting down, a sign of authority. Great crowds came to him, having with them the lame, the blind, the deformed, the mute, and many others. He placed them at his feet and he cured them. The crowds were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the deformed made whole, the lame walking, and the blind able to see. And they glorified the God of Israel. Again, the image. Jesus now sits down, the crowd comes to him, and he heals them all. And what happens as he's healing them, he's showing that he is indeed the Messiah. So the crowds were amazed when they saw all these things happening. And then Jesus summoned his disciples and said, My heart is moved with pity for the crowd. For they have been with me now for three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, for fear they may collapse on the way. In Mark's gospel, it's just all done in one day. But in Matthew's gospel, symbolically, three days. They're with him three days. The disciples said to him, Where could we ever get enough bread in this deserted place to satisfy such a crowd? Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? Seven, they replied, and a few fish. In Mark's gospel, they have five loaves. Seven is a symbolic number. It's really symbolic for the fact that in the, in the Canaanite area, 
the area of those who were not Jewish. Seven was a lucky number, perhaps, or really a fortunate number in their life, something good. He ordered the crowd to sit down on the ground. Then he took the seven loaves and the fish, gave thanks, and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, who in turn gave them to the crowds. Nothing is said about the fish. Symbolically, the bread symbolizes Eucharist in the mind of Christians. They all ate and were satisfied. They picked up the fragments left over, seven baskets full. Again, seven. In Mark's gospel, there's more than seven. Those who ate were 4,000 men, not counting women and children. And when he had dismissed the crowds, he got into the boat and came to the, to the district of Magadan. Chapter 16. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came and to test Jesus, asked him to show them a sign from heaven. In reality, through all his miracles, he has shown them signs, but they refused to see them. He said to them in reply, In the evening you say, Tomorrow will be fair, for the sky is red. And in the morning, today will be stormy, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to judge the appearance of the sky, but you cannot judge the signs of the times. They're able to do these wonderful things about nature, but they're not listening to Jesus. They don't understand Jesus. An evil and unfaithful generation seeks a sign, but no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Then he left them and went away. Jonah spent three days, three nights in the belly of a whale. Jesus is going to be put in the tomb for three days. And then in coming to the other side of the sea, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread. Jesus said to them, look out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They concluded among themselves that Jesus was, was saying, it is because we have brought no bread. When Jesus became aware of this, he said, Oh, you of little faith, why do you conclude among yourselves that it is because you have no bread? Do you not yet understand? And do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000? And how many wicker baskets you took up? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000? and how many baskets you took up. How do you not comprehend that I was speaking to you about bread? So what he's saying to them, if we needed bread, you already saw me multiply bread. You had to know I wasn't talking about bread. I was talking symbolically. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he was telling them to beware of the leaven of, not the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. When Jesus went into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah. Still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter said in reply, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. In Mark's gospel, he asked the same question. But Peter, when he answers here, he says, you are the Messiah. And he adds, the son of the living God. Jesus said to him and replied, this section here is taken from another source, not just Mark. Blessed are you, son of Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly father. You didn't figure this out on your own, 
This is an inspiration from God that I am the Messiah, the Son of God. And so I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. When he says build my church, he really means I will build my community. Upon you, my community will have a foundation. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Peter is giving the keys in the sense he's putting what's called the keys of Peter. The keys, the ability to bind and loose in God's name here on earth. Then he strictly ordered his disciples to tell no one that he was the Messiah. So what happens is Peter's making a profession of faith, which actually was fulfilled in the resurrection of Jesus. It's only found here in the Gospel of um, Matthew. So the first prediction of the Passion. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer greatly from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Jesus is predicting his passion. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. God forbid, Lord, no such thing shall ever happen to you. He turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an obstacle to me. You are thinking not as God does, but as humans do. It's really a slap in the face for Peter. He's comparing Peter to Satan. We see where Satan tempted Jesus in the desert, that he really simply all he has to do is change this, these rocks into bread or simply fall down and worship him and get the whole world tried to change his mission. And Peter is doing the same without realizing. He's saying, you're not going to have to suffer. No, God forbid you should suffer. And yet what Jesus does, he comes, he shares a message. He knows when he sticks, remains faithful to that message, he would be put to death. He's going to die. So Peter is trying to deter him from fulfilling his mission, which makes him say, get behind me, Satan. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Again, taken from Mark's Gospel. What profit would there be for one to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? Or what can one give in exchange for his life? He's talking about eternal life. What can anyone do in exchange for eternal life? Our life here on earth is very short compared to our eternal life. For the Son of Man will come with his angels in his Father's glory, and he will repay everyone according to his conduct. Amen, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death, until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What he's really saying here, there's some here who aren't going to die before they see the Son of Man, Jesus, come in his resurrection, the fulfillment of Jesus' life. Chapter 17. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them, 
and from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, and do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus alone. In the story of the Transfiguration, Jesus' his face shone like the sun. The idea being, he's in glory. There's Elijah and Moses speaking to him. He's the fulfillment of the law, symbolized by Moses and the fulfillment of the prophets, symbolized by the prophet Elijah. And so it shows Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And then Peter says, let us build some tents here. Apparently this was in, in link, in linking with uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. So it was linking with the Feast of Tabernacles, which would be a celebration when the people come into Jerusalem and they live in tents, Feast of Tabernacles. In the desert, when the people sojourned through the desert with Moses, they lived in tents. And so now Jesus is saying, don't tell anybody about this. Perhaps Matthew has this in here, that idea, same thing Mark, simply to say, how come we never heard of this before? Why are we hearing it now after the resurrection? Some commentators think it's a resurrection story put back into the life of Jesus. As others are saying here, Matthew, Mark and Matthew, it happened, but Jesus told them not to tell anybody. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, do not tell the vision to anyone until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Then the disciples asked him, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He said in reply, Elijah will indeed come and restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also will the Son of Man suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is in the spirit of Elijah, not the person of Elijah. Even though Elijah was taken off into heaven on a cloud, they don't know what happened to him. He never died. And so they expected him back. But then what happened? He says, Elijah has come in the person of John the Baptist. When they came to the crowd, a man approached, knelt down before Jesus and said, Lord, have pity on my son, for he is a lunatic and suffers severely. Often he falls into fire and often into water. It seems to be a re, uh, kind of an epilepsy fit. In Jesus' day, they thought that they had these fits when the moon was out, so they call a lunatic. That's really what it means, the full moon, the moon. And he suffers severely after he falls into fire and water. So he's having a fit. And then, or a seizure. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Jesus said in reply, O faithless and perverse generation, how long will I be with you? How long will I endure you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked him, and the demons came out of him. And from that hour, the boy was cured. Again, Jesus rebukes. He rebukes the demons, not, not the person who was having the seizure. And at the same time, it sounds like he's possessed at this moment. At this point, it's not a seizure. It's actually devil possession. Then the disciples approached Jesus in private and said, Why could we not drive it out? He said to them, because of your little faith. Amen, I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing 
will be impossible for you. And what he's saying, if we have even the tiniest bit of faith, we can do the impossible. It's not meaning that we move a mountain. That, that's frivolous in God's eyes for us. The idea being that simply we're called to do great things. People are look like they're never going to get out of a certain sin or never stop acting the way they are against God. We pray for that. If our faith was the size of a mustard seed, a little bit of faith and prayer, that can help a person. That can do the impossible. The second prediction of the Passion. As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is to be handed over to men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were overwhelmed with grief. Whenever Jesus speaks about his passion and death, he always adds something about his resurrection. And they really don't hear that part. They hear the part that talks about his suffering, and they were grieved. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax approached Peter and said, Doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he said. When he came into the house before he had time to speak, Jesus asked him, What is your opinion, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take tolls or census tax? From their subjects or from foreigners? When he said, from foreigners, Jesus said to him, Then the subjects are exempt. But that we may not offend them, go to the sea, drop in a hook, and take the first fish that comes up. Open its mouth and you will find a coin worth twice the temple tax. Give that to them for me and for you. Everybody was expected, at the age of 19 actually, to begin to pay taxes to the temple, for support of the temple. It was a temple tax. And the people being aware that Jesus claiming to be the Son of God, they asked the question, do you pay the temple tax? Everybody knows that a son doesn't pay taxes to his father. But Jesus, again, he avoids the question. He has Peter go get the taxes in the mouth of a fish. And so he avoids actually directly saying, as a son, I'm paying taxes. He's saying, God provided the tax. Chapter 18. At that time, the disciples approached Jesus and said, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child over, placed it in their midst, and said, Amen, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one child such as this in my name receives me. We'll have several instances here, several applications to children here, to acting like children. But when he's talking about children, he's not really just saying the children are the ones being saved. He's saying we have to be receptive as children, responsible, responsive as children. And so he's saying we have to be that kind. We learn from children how much they trust their parents. We have to trust God that way. And whoever causes one of these little ones, meaning Followers of Jesus, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for that person to have a great millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Drowning was a feared way of dying for the people of that age. Crucifixion and drowning, the two worst forms of dying. Woe to the world because of things that cause sin. Such things must come, but woe to the one to whom they come. Evil is in the world, there's some who accept it, but woe to that person who accepts it. So Jesus is saying, just because evil is in the world and comes from, or God allows it, what happens? 
but a person decides to go that way, they're still responsible. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter into life maimed or crippled than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into eternal fire. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye than with two eyes and to be thrown into the fiery Gehenna. Again, the idea is we should sacrifice the use of whatever we have to sacrifice. He doesn't want us to cut off our arms, hands, or anything like that. He's saying sacrifice the use of them if they're going to lead us into sin. Don't look at something we shouldn't be looking at if it's going to lead us into sin. Act as though we don't have that ability. He's not saying pluck out an eye. And then see that you do not despise one of these little ones. Again, Christians, for I say to you that their angels in heaven always look upon the face of my heavenly Father. What is your opinion? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, will he not leave the ninety-nine in the hills and go in search of the stray? And if he finds it, amen, I say to you, he rejoices more over it than over the ninety-nine that did not astray. And just the same way, it is not is the will not the will of your heavenly Father that one of these little ones be lost. So God rejoices when people in sin come back to God. We say God forgives sins, but not only does God forgive sins, it tells us here God rejoices when the sinner returns. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have won over your brother. He's talking about an offense against the church. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you so that every fact may be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, Tell the church, tell the community. If he refuses to listen even to the community, then treat him as you would a Gentile or a tax collector. In other words, if a person refuses to repent, change their ways, then you have to cut them off in some way. Amen, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus is here speaking to his disciples. Before this, he spoke to Peter, gave Peter this power. Now he gives it to his disciples, to the community. Again, amen, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything for which they ought to pray, it shall be granted to them by my heavenly Father. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Then Peter approaching him asked him, Lord, if my brother sins against me, how often must I forgive him? As many as seven times, Peter was thinking, I'm pretty magnanimous here. I'm forgiving him seven times. Jesus answered, I say to you, not seven times, but 77 times. That is why the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who decided to settle accounts with his servants. When he began the accounting, a debtor was brought in before him, who owed him a huge amount. Since he had no way of paying it back, his master ordered him to be sold, along with his wife, his children, and all his property in payment of the debt. At that, the servant fell down, did him homage, and said, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back in full. Move with compassion. The master of that servant let him go and forgave him the loan. When that servant had left, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a much smaller amount. 
He seized him and started to choke him, demanding, pay back what you owe. Falling to his knees, his fellow servant begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he had him put in prison until he paid back the debt. Now when his fellow servants saw what had happened, they were deeply disturbed and went to their master and reported the whole affair. His master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you your entire debt because you begged me to. Should you not have pity on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? Then in anger, his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. So will my heavenly father do to you unless each of you forgives his brother or sister from his heart. To which Jesus is saying to you, to them, how many times could I forgive? Seventy times seven. He's saying all the time. No, he's saying be unconditional. If you're going to fix it, forgive somebody, forgive them. A man comes owing a huge debt and he begs the master to forgive him. The master unconditionally forgives him. But then he goes out and he doesn't forgive others. And he refuses to forgive a fellow servant. The master becomes upset. And now the master throws him into prison. The symbolism there is God forgives us a great deal. And sometimes someone hurts us. And we're asked to forgive that person. Jesus says 70 times 7. He doesn't mean go back into the same situation. But he's saying be a forgiving person. But then what happens is that sometimes we forget that God forgave us so many things. And we're not that fast at forgiving others. And so what Jesus is saying to us is we should have un unconditional forgiveness sometimes, even when it hurts. Then there's a ministry in Judea and Jerusalem. And the first question Jesus much approaches is the idea of marriage, marriage and divorce. When Jesus finished these words, he left Galilee and went to the district of Judea across the Jordan. Great crowds followed him and he cured them there. Some Pharisees approached him and tested him saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause whatever? He said in reply, have you not read that from the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, no human being must separate. What Jesus is saying, marriage is a great gift. It comes from God. Not only do people just say, okay, we're going to be together. They actually share together. It's as though they absorb each other in some way. And so what happens is the two become one. And so it's a great gift, a great mystery. It's a sacrament in the Catholic Church. We believe it's a sacrament given by Jesus. So he's saying, see how great this sacrament is. What God has joined together, no one must separate. And of course, in the Catholic Church, we know that there are things like annulments, other ways of saying, what really happened? Was it really a marriage from the beginning? And so there's investigations made and a decision is made. People who are divorced and remarried doesn't say that they're condemned. No, that's something else. But what Jesus is saying here, look how great the gift of that marriage is. Look what really happens. They said to him, then why did Moses command that a man give the woman a bill of divorce and dismiss her? He said to them, because of the hardness of your hearts, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So right from God's plan, divorce was not part of God's plan. The two become one. But I say to you, 
whoever divorces his wife, unless the marriage is unlawful. There are many things that there are many Jewish laws saying you couldn't marry a relative or something along those lines. And the Gentiles allowed it. But now the Gentiles were becoming Christians with their families, married contrary to the law of Christ as they saw it. And so unless it's unlawful, it's again to be investigated and determined. But that person divorces his wife and marries another. That person commits adultery if the marriage is valid. His disciples said to him, if that is the case of a man and his wife, it is better not to marry. So they see a difficulty in that in Jesus' day. He answered, not all can accept this word, but only those to whom it is granted. Some are incapable of marriage because they were born that way. Some because they were made so by others. Some because they have renounced the marriage. They have done this for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Whoever can accept this ought to accept it. So Jesus is saying, marriage is a wonderful gift. That's really the import of what's being said here. And sometimes we overlook it. Divorce is a sad thing in creation. It happens. People are not condemned. They should seek help. But at the same time, he's basically saying, but keep an eye on the greatness of the marriage ceremony itself. The two shall become one. God made the male and female, and the two shall become one. Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hand on them and pray. The disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not prevent them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And he placed his hands on them, and then he went away. Again, the importance of children. Back in Jesus' day, children didn't matter that much many times. They were ignored. They were pushed aside. And yet Jesus is saying, these children are very important. Again, in our society, recognizing that children are important to God. God gives us children. It's part of God's plan. And so how does that fit in? Jesus loves children. Let the children come to me, he said, and do not prevent them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Now someone approached him and said, Teacher, what good must I do to gain eternal life? He answered, Why do you ask me about good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. Jesus is saying, God is good. How do you see me as being good? And so it happens, he calls him teacher. He doesn't call him God here. So he's saying, you're calling me teacher, so I can't be like God in your mind. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. The man asked Jesus, which one? And Jesus replied, you shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have observed. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go, sell what you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this statement, he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Jesus is talking about the burden of possessions, many possessions. So the young man heard this statement. He went away sad because he had many possessions. He, he couldn't serve Jesus as his master. His possessions had become his master. This is the only time in the scriptures when someone is invited by Jesus to follow him and doesn't do it. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Amen, I say to you, it will be hard for the one who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for one who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So it's easier to have a camel fit through a very small space 
than for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished and said, Who then can be saved? They saw the gift of richness as a blessing from God. And if the rich cannot be saved, then who could be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For human beings, this is impossible. But for God, all things are possible. So Jesus is not saying it's bad to be rich, but he's saying we have to keep our eye on God. And for human beings, a person can be rich and also praise God, especially in sharing that gift. Then Peter said to him and replied, We have given up everything and followed you. What will there be for us? Jesus said to him, Amen, I say to you that you who have followed me in the new age, when the Son of Man is seated on his throne of glory, will yourselves sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. We're an apostolic church. We look back to the apostles and we say, the church in a sense through Jesus is built upon the apostles. And then the apostles shared that gift with others as we see how the church developed. But he's saying, you will sit on 12 thrones. The image he's using is a kingly image. But he's really saying, you are the people who receive the first graces to be shared with others. And everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or lands for the sake of my name will receive a hundred times more and will inherit, inherit eternal life. But many, but many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Again, what he's saying here is simply those who give up so much, we should treat them with a certain respect. Recognize that they really have given their life for the sake of others. We look around the world today, we see so many who have really sacrificed what others would consider a dream. They've sacrificed for the sake of helping others. Mother Teresa and people like that, they've given their life to service for the sake of others. Many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. It looks like the rich, the powerful, they look like they're the ones who really are running this world. But in reality, the last will be first. People who give themselves to sharing with others, they will really be recognized as the important thing, people in God's creation. So Jesus is saying, this is what it means to be a disciple. This is what it means to be a disciple who gives up as much as we can, who tries to enter into the perfect marriage, the perfect life, the whatever it is that we're called to. But the idea being, we are meant to serve God wherever we are, in whatever way God calls us. That's discipleship. And Matthew then is continuing to teach us what it really means to be a disciple and how Jesus is with us on our journey. We'll continue next week with the Gospel of Matthew. May the light of Christ lead me. The power of Christ be with me. The wisdom of Christ inspire me. The word of Christ instruct me. The shelter of Christ protect me. The hand of Christ hold me. The love of Christ be in me. May the grieving find support in me. The sad find joy in me. The depressed find hope in me. The weak find strength in me. The doubters find faith in me. The rejected find love in me. And the world find Christ in me. And may Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.